building history, the entire collection of all things that have ever happened, ever. Today, I wanna to talk to you about making creative and realistic histories to tell about our world building projects. And halfway through, I'll show you an example in my ever growing world building project, the Coda Lakes series. I'm Jack from Stoneworks. Hit that like and subscribe to Tator button and shout out to my awesome patrons and OnlyFans subs. Thank you so much. And if you want to join the awesome world building discord, Worldworks, look in the description and let's get into it. History is a weird thing. Everyone thinks that they're a historian because they have some conception of what happened in the past. Either the stories their family told them, what they learned in high school, or what YouTube historians say in their goofy videos. But I studied history at the same college that Plankton went to, and I'll tell you that it gets real complicated, real difficult, and really, really, really dark. Let's look at how to weave a complex tale of intricate causes, effects, trends, and interesting characters, all without getting overwhelmed and causing an information overload. I'll split these instructions into three parts. The first going over the choices you make as a world builder, the second talking about how historians frame histories so that we can use their same techniques and keep a coherent narrative while hinting at a larger developed world, and third being my opinions on how human history actually works and unfolds. This will be a spicy one, folks. If you see my channel get deleted, it'll be because of some real heinous things that I say in the comments. Like and subscribe so you can join the hashtag StoneworksIsOver party. This is how to world build history. 1. Write your history in either a subjective or objective perspective. As a world builder, you have choices of how to write your history. Are you going to write your history as someone in the world would with their biases, errors, and cultural context in mind? Or will you write down an objective, factual, and literal account of the things that happened? Writing down the objective happenings is very useful, but writing down a subjective artifact of in-character history is more personal and dynamic. The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings are written as a manuscript inside of Middle-earth by Bilbo and Frodo, which J.R.R. Tolkien fictionally found and translated. What we have there is not an objective recounting of the literal things that happened in the world. I bet it's a bit of a heavily changed and mythologized cultural epic from inside of Middle-earth. I personally like to write in-world from my characters' perspectives so I can fill it with all kinds of mythologies and legends, biased storytelling, and catty mudslinging, cause who doesn't love that? I usually have some vague idea of the literal things that happened, but I never commit them to paper, which makes the world feel more properly lived in, contentious, and complex to me. 2. Mythology and history work totally differently. This is kind of a minor point that is worth stating up front. A lot of world building stories feature giant gods or godlike sci fi aliens. Very cool. And you'll have these single, extremely powerful individuals making world shaping decisions that are a part of this story. This gives license for the single personalities to have a much larger impact on the world. Like how Greek mythology says that the goddess Demeter's sadness is what creates winter every single year. Mythology is much more imbued with a dreamlike logic and magic where individual beings have immense physical power over the world, but also make some strange choices that make for quirky stories. Lots of world builders and fantasy histories are very mythological, but I see that as another category of the kind of storytelling that we're talking about. There's no place in our modern conception of history where divine beings create a giant robot to survey the universe and create an archipelagic world inside of itself. Yeah, you didn't think that a history video would use Bionicle lore as an example, did ya? So here, for now, I'm gonna focus on the agency of little itty bitty humans, where power comes from technology and influencing the masses, and things don't get nearly as wacky on a large scale. I personally like to have my world building histories be almost entirely human driven with extraordinary moments of divine intervention. God, I need to finally make that video on how religions and gods actually work. So choose how mythological or realistically historical you want your world's story to be, and then go wild. Number 3. Gain inspiration from real history and other people's lore. Honestly, a really, really big part of having a creative story to tell is just having a lot of good influences and knowledge of history to draw upon. I watch a lot, a lot, a lot of YouTube history videos. If I want to have in my story a poet king with an epic backstory who does religious reforms, I can draw upon the story of the king Nezahualcoyotl. 
If I need a leader who created social military reforms and formed an empire by breaking from traditions of ritual warfare, I can draw on Shaka Zulu. Just knowing different interesting moments in history gives me more influences in my arsenal to reflect on how things happened and how I can make interesting moments to mirror them in my own stories. 4. Write your histories as real historians do, as constructed narratives. History is either told as a kind of story, an argument, or just as a straight up data dump. I don't know how many academic articles of history you guys have read, but some of them are just f***ing awful. For us world builders who want to make engaging worlds, we should tell them as stories. But truthfully speaking, when you're thinking about how history actually happens, if there's a million people involved and witnessing it, a fully accurate history will tell the story a million separate times. So storytelling historians have to pick and choose which perspectives and details are important to telling the story and neglect the rest. So how do you choose which things are and aren't important? Well, you're gonna need a methodology. If you're writing a history, choose a protagonist that your story either centers around or is fully in their perspective. Then choose the events, time period, and chain of events that you're covering, and then choose what categories of history you're writing about. Here on screen is what I would say are the most basic categories. Stuff like politics, military, religion, social institutions, art, culture, environment, technology, economy, language, philosophy, you know. Although, truthfully, these are pretty much arbitrary, loosely defined, and overlapping. So, for example, take a look at the January 6th riot slash insurrection at the US Capitol a few years ago. Hotly debated and legally contested event, it's a perfect example to see how much perspective changes the story that you tell. Let's choose a protagonist, a time period and events to cover, and categories that we're looking at it from. If we choose to follow a random, radical rioter, maybe we'd start our narrative with them first voting for Trump, or when they first started talking about Jewish space lasers. If we follow the liberal media, maybe we'd start with moments that show that people did not trust them. Or maybe we'd follow reporters who were actually there at the riot and then stay on them at that day in particular. If we follow President Trump, then maybe we start with some big dip that he first had in the polls, or when he first indicated he wouldn't accept election results, and maybe we'd end it with Darth Brandon declaring the Imperial Empire of America. You can see how who you choose to follow frames the events that you'll be talking about, and what categories of history you can engage with. I'll say, don't consciously fret over this too much, because if you have a good idea of the story that you want to tell, who to follow and what to cover comes sort of naturally. Now let's say we follow President Trump in our historical retelling. You can choose any of these categories to focus on, and it would create completely different stories. If you choose politics, it's pretty obvious. It's a core aspect of the event since the whole debacle was about an election. Economics could highlight the economic difficulties that brought unrest against the government bureaucracy that motivated Trump supporters. Military could highlight the relationship between Trump's actions and the US military, and you could even pull in stuff like language and art to talk about how rhetoric and MAGA symbolism contributed to these events. So if you're world building history, I suggest choosing a few of these categories to focus on, enough to make it interesting and dynamic where they feed into each other, but not too many categories so it becomes difficult to follow and overly complex. I tend to stick with three or four, my favorites being politics, religion, military, and social institutions. You're gonna know what categories you are naturally interested in. 5. Certain periods of history are filled up with legendary details and stories. I think this one's pretty easy to understand. Generally, the further back you go in history, the less a society concretely remembers, the simpler the story gets, and the more legendary details and stories get added in. If you read even the Hebrew Bible chronologically, the way, way far back stories like Genesis and the Exodus are conceptually really simple and linear, and they're filled with myths and supernatural legends where God directly intervenes. Then, further up in the stories of, like, King David and Solomon, they're more realistic and more human-centric, they're a bit more complex, but they're still filled with heroic stories and supernatural happenings. Then as you get closer to the time that these documents were written, like around the kings Hezekiah and Josiah, the main narrative beats are way more historical. They're about policies, wars, building projects, and treaties. They are way more historical and less legendary. I'm not saying it's an objective, non-religious history, but you can see the pattern that it creates. But these legends don't form only as you go further back in time. 
it's also for the big moments in a group's history. There are lots of legendary stories surrounding big moments in Roman history, like in the Punic Wars, the assassination of Julius Caesar, Constantine converting to Christianity, all that kind of stuff. If there's a major plot point in a nation's history, later renditions of it will tend to glob on these fanciful details, sometimes supernatural, in order to drive home an emotional point. Rome did not literally plow a million tons of salt into Carthage's soil to make them barren, but the story drives home the fact that they beat the ever-living f out of them. Now this especially applies to origin stories, because people see the origins of an institution as being indicative of that institution's character, or same with like a people group or a country, religion, all that kind of stuff. The American Founding Fathers have their own little canon of legendary stories, from Washington admitting to cutting down a cherry tree to his angry father, to Benjamin Franklin flying a kite and discovering electricity in a thunderstorm, to many of them being brilliant inventors and philosophers. Controversially, these stories don't show us as much about what the Founders' histories actually are as much as they show us how we want to view America. Because if America was founded by truly Enlightenment individuals, then we gain a sense of modern guidance and character from those individuals and those stories that they have associated with them. Why do you think that the legacy of the Founding Fathers is so hotly contested right now? Because the American citizenry is extremely split on how we should view our country. Intermission! Okay, intermission time. After this, I'm talking more broad opinions on how human history actually unfolds. So do not take these as academic or literal at all. I do not have the time to properly back each claim up. These ideas have come from what I've studied in college and noticed from a giant history simulating Minecraft server that I've run for four years. Join today at play.stoneworks.gg. It's lit. Point number six, trends build people and people build trends. There's an old thing called great man history, which basically chalks all historical development up to the deeds of men in power. Remember fellas, women? Nah. But history is actually an interplay between large scale trends and movements in tandem with the actions of individual influential people. Let's take a non-controversial example that we can all agree on, Jesus. Put simply enough to warrant crucifying me, in the cultural context of Jesus' ministry, the Roman Empire was occupying the region of Judea, and Jewish society was extremely socially and politically fractured under them. There were several new social and religious ideas gaining lots of traction and generating new movements and schools of thought. Among these was the growing need for an apocalyptic messiah. The guy who would come down, drive out the foreigners, and restore God's kingdom on earth. Jesus was one of these guys, and he gained a devoted following and lots of attention. Jesus' life and teachings, which was an innovative blend of new ideas, certain Jewish schools of thoughts, and Greek and Middle Eastern influences, became central to the development of a new, inspiring religious philosophy which branched out into the Eastern Mediterranean. Groups of Jesus' followers developed and wrote down the stories of Jesus' life and teachings, as well as their new theology surrounding him, which then spread around the empire and converted more and more people, particularly of lower classes like slaves and women at first, and then it trickled up. Several Roman emperors persecuted the Christians for various reasons, until their influence became so strong that Constantine decided to legalize it and maybe convert for himself. So do you see what I mean here? Jesus stood on the cultural context of his time, and then revolutionized future cultural contexts with his life and teachings. I like to think of history as a big stream. Everyone flows like water down it together. But people with lots of influence can divert the water in one way or another, which will erode out new riverbends and totally alter the path that the water goes down. 7. People and institutions work based off of self-interest and people's feelings about them. All right, this one is really long and verbose, so give me some time to explain. So all people and institutions will act on their self-interests and incentives. Not entirely, I'm not a pessimist about people's natures and attitudes, all that kind of stuff, but it's safe to say that everyone acts far more in their self-interest than against them. I'm going to assume that you, the viewer, know what this means and implies for world-building history, where people and groups will act to increase their power, money, status, stability, all of that as a kind of default. Let's take that for granted as a rule of human behavior. But more complexly, 
power and institutions also work based off of the psychology of the people involved and the people around them. On God, even something as seemingly concrete as money incentives or military force is, at the end of the day, psychological. If someone doesn't believe that your currency is valuable, or they don't trust that you'll actually pay them, you have no payment power over them. Or say a military can't convince people to sign up, or they can't keep their privates in line. Yeah. Or soldiers retaliate on commanders when disciplined. Then you don't have a strong military force and it's kinda useless. On a mass scale, it does all go back to the psychology of people involved. Institutions, whether they be government, religious figures, family structures, gender roles, any of that, all depend on people being convinced that the institution is sufficiently good, powerful, legitimate, respectable, authoritative, well-attested from tradition, or any of that. It's a game of persuasion and soft power. An institution, as powerful and old as the Catholic Church, could theoretically be rendered obsolete overnight. Everyone could suddenly start thinking that they don't hold an important role in personal salvation, their traditions aren't grounded in biblical tradition, the fancy clothes and rituals aren't inspiring, and they don't have an unbroken line of popes all the way back to Mr. Jesus himself. What I'm trying to tell you is, be gay, do crime. It's all a game of persuasion, and these notions and narratives are a part of the maintenance of that power and legitimacy of the church. This also works for people, by the way. Say a senator puts down a conspiracy to overturn the republic, then that senator will be well respected as a trustworthy cornerstone of democratic values, and they can sway other people's votes with their opinions alone. This is how the Roman senator Cicero got so powerful. There's a crisis, you respond to it well, you get credit for fixing it, and people respect you enough to be influenced by your decisions. Or say that they got embroiled in a controversy that degrades the group's trust in them. Then they will legitimately lose power, and the group may go through some turmoil and find new leaders. I actually had this happen to me recently. People were saying I was firing Jewish space lasers. Guys, I'm not even Jewish. A seriously great example of this is in Game of Thrones. The House Lannister has a motto saying, A Lannister always pays his debts. Because they've built a reputation of being wealthy and reliable on paying back their loans. But they'll also get cold revenge on anyone who f**ks with them. That's how a public perception translates to political power and being able to move resources around. Additionally, Institutions and people also problem-solve based on what they believe to work, which is often a reflection of their recent history. Germany before its 1871 unification was generally held together by a strong tradition of diplomacy through institutions, the Holy Roman Empire, and then the German Confederation. Superficially speaking, that's how many of the German states solved their problems. But Prussia was an outlier. They developed a tradition of nationalistic military hegemony, and they eventually unified the German area through a series of wars with its neighbors. It legitimized the notion that nationalism and militarism worked to solve geopolitical problems. Now, obviously what I'm saying is surface level, there's tons of exceptions and counterexamples, but it does help explain why Germany formed into a slightly belligerent state. It culminated in the Nazis, who really learned into that hyper-nationalistic militarism to a psychotic apocalyptic extent. That whole cultural logic can become super detached from reality if it becomes entrenched enough. Oh, and honestly, the destruction of the world wars and the prevailing diplomatic environment of modern Europe is a testament to this too. How we remember the world wars delegitimizes those notions of nationalism and militarism in Europe. So now we gotta talk, integrate, and buy our way into getting what we want. Except you, Putin. F*** you. Again. These are broad, sweeping assertions, but if your world-building institutions that develop over time in your history, whether they be governments, religious authorities, guilds, anyone that has power and resources to be influential, just keep in mind these three things. They're acting on their own incentives and self-interests, their power is based on the confidence of the people involved or surrounding the institution, and they're going to have certain conceptions of what works versus what doesn't work to solve their problems. These factors explain a lot of how the powerful parts of society act. So, be gay, do crime. 8. There are always problems, but the wheel always turns. 
As individual people, and as societies, we are always in an arms race with the tricksy gnomes that steal our underwear and cause our mass problems. Every solution that we have brings with it new specific problems. Out of nowhere there'll come some scandal or random plague that shakes everything up, and if you don't actively maintain the rules and boundaries that keep your institutions in place, people are gonna start breaking them for their own self-interest and tear down any progress you've made. Existing is an exhausting practice. People always have reasons to complain, whether their problems are big or small. But the wheel does turn, and the good times and the bad times trade places. Now, I can't tell you what causes Dark Ages or Golden Ages, because holy hell is that even too complicated for me to overgeneralize, but I can tell you that they come and go. I'm a bit embarrassed to admit how many times I've seen world builders take their favorite kingdom and then have them live in a perpetual Golden Age. No! Just for one example of how silly that is, if there's a big golden age and a state grows in power, soon they'll run out of existential external enemies and the people running the state will probably turn against each other as internal enemies, split over disagreements or political parties, and then you have an inept government, crises, and civil wars. Humans are not that stable. So make sure your world building histories have a feeling of ebb and flow to them, where the good times and the bad times come and go, and the odd sudden event really shakes the earth and changes the status quo. But nothing lasts forever. This was my attempt in showing you how to world build history. And just as a bonus for you loyal listeners, I'm going to create a list of archetypes of historical events based on my understanding of world history. We've got three columns explaining the event, context, and historical or literary inspiration. A general is threatened with punishment, so he begins a civil war. The context is that his soldiers and military hierarchies have no direct accountability or attachment to the state, and it's inspired by the civil wars of An Lu Shan and Julius Caesar. If you comment some ideas based on your favorite moments in history, I'll read through them and add them to the list alongside your username for credit. Let's crowdsource some history. Now beyond this, I've created an addendum video of my Coda Lake series if you want to see all of this put into action. So join me over there to check out some mouse empires. I'm Jack from Stoneworks. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.